my name is Kenneth Goodman. Uh, I'm a philosopher who is a professor of medicine and philosophy at the University of Miami, where I direct the Miller School of Medicine's Institute for Bioethics and Health Policy. Thank you so much uh, to be with, with us uh, today. I would like to know uh, for you, uh, what does it mean ethics uh, today, specifically in the area of uh, palliative care and uh, genomics? So one of the things that is valuable or useful about ethics is when a science evolves, or in the case of medicine, certain clinical practices evolve, and it's available, that is, ethics is available to help answer really difficult questions that are not empirical questions. Uh, there, there's no experiment we can do to do ethics. Uh, we are the way there is in, 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 in hepatology or palliative care or neurology. Ethics, we had our answers differently. Uh, and so, for instance, in palliative care, given the growth in, in the science of palliative care, the evidence based for palliative care, its adoption universally as, as, a, as a practical solution to many problems, uh, it also comes ensemble with, with questions related to, well, end of life care, appropriate pain management, uh, the duty of clinicians to be more competent in rendering palliative care, eliminating misunderstanding and misapprehensions about palliative care. Um, one of the issues that arises for me in the hospital where I work, uh, we do ethics consultations, and one of the most common issues uh, uh, around end-of-life care always end, ends up touching at least a little bit on palliative care, either pain management or palliation in its much broader sense, which, by the way, is very important to educate people about. Um, pain management raises a number of interesting ethical issues. Uh, and we can help our colleagues do everything from communicate with family members, educate about death and dying, talk about appropriate doses of, of very risky medication, doses which can be fatal, uh, and provide guidance for them, practical guidance for them in, in, in making decisions. We're not priests, imams, or rabbis. Uh, we are, are, are health professionals. I'm a philosopher uh, who give our colleagues in addition to palliative care, genetics and genomics offer beautiful examples of the practical utility of applied ethics. We've known for some time that the ability to, to analyze the human genome, to make predictions that are clinically useful, to study it, to store it in databases, to store it in biorepositories and biobanks, raised a number of ethical issues. The first thing that ethics was able to do was identify the issues. And in fact, that's what we see with any new technology, namely, what are the ethical issues and how should society begin thinking about them? So in the case of genetics, what's interesting about genetic information is that while we want to protect the privacy of it, the genetic information about me is not only about me. It's also about my parents in one degree or another, also about my children. It may be about my brothers, my sisters, and so forth. Uh, and some of that can be really quite delicate and really quite tricky. Um, it might be that you've made a diagnosis that I wanted to know the results of, but my daughter doesn't, or my father doesn't, or my brother doesn't. Uh, when should that information be disclosed? How should it be disclosed? And by whom? In fact, a new profession, that of a genetic counselor, has, has evolved in the past several decades to try and, and, and uh, deal with communication issues. Uh, we find ethical issues related to being able to predict a malady that's, for which we have no treatment or no cure. A rational person might say, I don't want to know. But a rational person also might say, I do want to know. And it's very difficult in advance to know which that is without, without tipping a few of your cards so that they can, in fact, uh, know that there's either good news or bad news coming. Um, one of the challenges we find, face in some human subjects research is that when you rely too much on genetics, you can make an interesting mistake. Uh, in fact, that depending on a number of different factors, it turns out that, well, the man you've been calling daddy for many years might not be daddy. 
Uh, and when we learn that as an artifact of a, a study in human subjects research, we now have a great social problem. We should have prepared for that. We should have anticipated that better. This was an ethical issue identified uh, uh, early on. Um, right now, there's a lot about personalized medicine and uh, pharmacogenomics. Uh, the issues there are very, very broad. One of them is what, how much consent do you need to analyze residual blood in a database? Uh, what privacy issues are raised uh, when it comes to families, as I just described? And one that I think is really quite important for a lot of genetics research, and I support genetics research, but it's very, very expensive. And I want to make sure that if genetics research succeeds in developing new drugs, it develops new drugs that are widely shared. Let's say right now we have terrible health disparities in the world and in many of our countries. Uh, if, if you have a lot of money, you have more access to drugs than people who don't. I've supported genetics research and for that matter stem cell research, but with the understanding that the drugs that will be developed will not create a whole new generation of disparities and inequities. Uh, that social, social parity and social uh, uh, equity uh, remains, I think, a very important ethical issue, and we should, we should make sure it covers all aspects of biomedical research. Thank you so much. And um, related to what you described, what are for you the most important innovation today to improve uh, service delivery, specifically for palliative care and, and genomics, as you, you have mentioned? So service delivery remains uh, a, a fascinating area of, of, uh, of health system operations. It doesn't matter that we know how to do something if we're unable to provide it for the people who, to whose trouble we went to develop it in the first place. Um, I'm of the view, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I think this, this is actually itself an area that, that we could do far more research in, that the sciences of data analysis, of meta-analysis, for example, um, uh, of, of uh, ge use of geographic information systems, for instance, um, and of, of our ability to reanalyze electronic health records are precious sources of data and of information to improve service delivery. Uh, healthcare systems suffer from many maladies, many impediments, and many difficulties. Uh, I would prefer to see service delivery as an opportunity to gather and metabolize all the information that we can in the interest of providing um, higher quality, more evidence-based, equitable service, health services to people. All of that requires more information, and all of that information raises questions of confidentiality, of privacy, of appropriate access to the information. And then about the, even at the level of, of, uh, of computer science, uh, how do you know that your program is an ad adequate program, or your computer program, or that the database was well structured, or that the data as it was coming in was actually being stored and was not corrupted uh, in, in some sort of way. And so you end up having as a very large ethical issue, quality. Attending to standards and attending to quality become themselves ethical imperatives. And, and uh, related to what you describe, what are the main risks uh, to use, in fact, uh, this innovative solution if uh, the population, unfortunately, have not the capacity to be well informed, you know, or to be aware, for example, about their uh, human rights? So, um, in, in the health, uh, in the context of health delivery and health systems, uh, there's a rather well known problem called health literacy. If, in fact, people are generally ignorant, and I think in most jurisdictions many people are when it comes to their health, then all of the problems we face are amplified, are magnified. It's, it is a lens that the problem goes through. If I don't understand what cells are and what viruses are or what antibiotics do, and, or, or to be able to, to explain that if I have a virus, Many people don't know that you should not prescribe an antibiotic for a virus. That's a basic aspect of health literacy that I think poses perhaps the most challenging impediment of all. The risks that we face are, are actually risks, I think, that are shaped by, by low health literacy, uh, by a lack of understanding of science, 
Um, even, even in Europe and North America uh, and, and, and other places where we think of ourselves as having long-standing, robust traditions of education, there are still many disparities and many failures of, of, of society to ensure that to be a functioning member of a civil democratic society, I have some responsibilities too. And my responsibilities include learning about a little bit about public health. Um, that the risks that we face are risks of ignorance and then risks of, of trying to overcome the ignorance um, by mechanisms other than reducing it. That, that's a, let me restate that because it's, 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 uh, it's a complex thought. And I so rarely have complex thoughts. Um, we might surrender. We might say, look, there's just no way this population is going to understand. And therefore, we try and go around the problem of health literacy. I think that poses a terrible risk uh, because it, it, and then, then it requires that health systems, and leaders of health systems, leaders of health delivery systems, um, make decisions that are, that are not necessarily population-based, not necessarily with the, the consent, even the latent or implied consent of people. It becomes an intervention which, however well-motivated it is, is imposed on a population. It is far better to have educated people in civil society be a part of their own health care, to take, to take some, some role. The government's job, society's job, is to make sure that it's equitably shared, fairly shared, affordable for everyone, uh, including people with no, with no money whatsoever. Uh, when it comes to public health, viruses don't carry little passports. Uh, and so we want to make sure that, that what we do uh, is, 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 shared, is shared regionally, is shared internationally, and I think is shared globally. The health of, of civilization, the life on Earth, requires that we do a better job sharing our resources and making sure that we can improve the health of populations around the world. Thank you very much. I think you have light, um, you have a light, um, very important key message, you know, and maybe uh, if you have some, I would say, three or four key messages for our audience, what, we, what it would be? Learn. Uh, <laughs> learn and be a good teacher. You know, the Latin word authority comes from teacher. So those of you are a health professional, find time to talk to school children. Um, school children and adults take some responsibility for learning about these things. The, 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 their public health officials at the World Health Organization and elsewhere are struggling to try and, and reduce the burden of disease on, on humanity. Don't make their job more difficult than it already is. Three, understand how public health works and how information is gathered. We know in many respects a lot about genetics, a lot about palliative care, a lot about healthcare delivery and the delivery of healthcare services because we were able to analyze data and information. Participate in that. Understand that people are gathering information. Uh, that when they can ask, they will ask, but sometimes they can't ask. And because we trust them, we allow them to gather this de-identified or anonymized uh, information. Um, I think those are the things I would, I would suggest the most, uh, that it, it learn, communicate, and understand the, the systems that people who are trying to improve the health of populations use. It's not about them doing something for everybody. It's about the collective taking responsibility for itself. Thank you so much uh, to be uh, with us uh, uh, today. It was a very uh, good pleasure uh, to have this interview uh, with you. A pleasure. That's why.